This video is sponsored by Sketchfab. Using curves is probably my favorite thing to do with geometry nodes. That's how I made my lightning, barbed wire, and cable generator. Let's check out all the different ways we can use curves. Here's a summary of what I'll cover in this video. I'll start with showing the primitive curve shapes we can use, how to join them together, and a few ways we can change their shape. Then I'll show how to change the resolution of curves and why you would want to do that. We have the option to give curves thickness as well as changing their tilt, so I'll talk about ways to control that. I'll talk about options we have when instancing things onto curves, and at the end I'll show how to make a curve that connects all the points of any object. If you're a complete beginner with geometry nodes, you might want to watch this video first where I explain the basics. Also, check my Patreon for the project files from my videos, coupon codes for free Gumroad products, early access to videos, and stuff I don't share anywhere else. I also donate a portion of the profits to environmental causes each month. Links for everything are in the description. Alright, let's get started. So here we are in Blender, I'm using version 3.1 for this one, and like I've said in previous videos, you want to make sure that you're using version 3.1 or later. If you're using anything uh, earlier than that, then, you know, some of these options might not exist or nodes might be named different things. I'm also going to be using the Node Wrangler, which you can turn on under Edit, Preferences, Add-ons. Type in Node Wrangler and make sure that this box is checked. So curves are something that have existed in Blender uh, since before Geometry Nodes, and we can add them in with Shift-A. Below Mesh, we have this curve option. So I'll just add in a Bezier curve right here. And we can tab into edit mode and, you know, see what it looks like. Right now it's just two points, one at either end, and you can scale and rotate these around and do things like that. Um, you can also, you know, extrude these if you want to add more points. And one other cool thing that you can do with curves is if you go into edit mode and hit T to open up this sidebar right here, uh, you can also grab this little arrow. We have this option down here called draw, which lets you just draw whatever you want and it will turn it into a curve for you like that. We also have some options over here under depth. I'm looking at cursor and surface. So if you have this set to cursor, whenever you draw, things will be on the same plane as your 3D cursor right here, which is this thing in the very center. Uh, but we can change this to surface and that lets us draw on the surface of any object like this. Uh, so now when we look at this, from the side, you can see that it's, you know, on the surface of Susan the monkey right here. But when you're using curves with geometry nodes, you don't always have to start with a curve. So I'll bring in a mesh too. I'll add in a plane right here. And we'll go into the geometry nodes workspace, uh, which is up here. And if you don't have that up here, just click the plus button. It's under general geometry nodes right there. So make sure that you have your plane selected right here, and then you can click new to add a new geometry nodes setup. And that will also add in this modifier. So a plane right here, this is a mesh, it's not a curve. So if you wanted to turn this into a curve, you can hit shift A over here. It's under mesh. We have this option right here called mesh to curve. So you can drag that in. And as soon as you do that, you can see that the faces disappear, but this is turned into a curve. So if you hit Shift-A again, you can use any of these, you know, curve nodes right here uh, to put afterward. And this is pretty cool because you can use normal modeling techniques in edit mode, um, like the same way that you would do with any mesh, except now it's a curve. So this opens up a lot of options, and it means that you don't have to model with curves constantly. Other than that, we have a bunch of curve primitives too, just like the mesh primitives. So you can hit shift A and we have this menu item, curve primitives, with all of these in there. So I'm just going to delete these two right here with X and add in all these curve primitives. So these are all of the curve primitives we have, and I'm not going to go through and talk about all of the options we have with these. So I encourage you to just open them up and poke around and experiment with them. But we will look at a few. So if you're using Node Wrangler, you can preview any of these by holding Alt, Shift, and left click like that, and that will plug it into the group output for you. So right now we're looking at the arc, and you can see this is what we have. You can change the angle like that. We also have some other options like connect to the center, and it makes it look more like there's like a slice out of a pie or, you know, like a lily pad or kind of like Pac-Man, something like that. We have this spiral too that lets you change a lot of things like the start radius, the height, um, and the amount of rotations like that. So you can do cool things there too. And we also have the star 
which would be pretty good for doing things like making uh, flowers, or you could make things like saw blades by changing this twist like that. And just like meshes, you can join these together with the join geometry node. So if you hit shift A under geometry, you can get, we can get the join geometry node right here. I'll just plug that in. And I'll just uh, plug in the quadrilateral with the star. And now we have both of them right here. And you can plug in as many as you want to join them together. So if you want, you can fill the faces in too. And that is with a node call the fill curve node right here. So I'll use this just on the star right here. You can see it's filling it in with faces. And if we look closer at this node right here, it takes a curve and it outputs a mesh. So you want to make sure if you're using any curve nodes that you're using them before this node. Otherwise, you know, you'll be trying to use them on a mesh and it might not work. Another cool thing about the fill curve is if you put this after you join multiple things together like this, It'll adapt to try to make holes in it and things like that too. And if we look at the wireframe, this is what's going on. It's trying to keep everything as triangles. You can also change this to n-gons. And you can get some really interesting results by, uh, you know, changing the sizes of these. See if we make it bigger, where it's like overlapping. Now it's trying to fill in all of these faces right here. And we end up with a pretty cool result. So definitely experiment with doing things like this. You can, you know, come up with some pretty cool shapes. Let's make this smaller again. We also have this other node under curve called the fillet curve right here. Again, let's just use this on just the star first. So when I drop this in right here, it might be hard to tell what it's doing. So let's turn the radius of this down quite a bit. You can see when we start to turn it up, basically what it's doing is taking each point and beveling it like that. And if we push it too far, it'll kind of go inside out like that but we have this option called limit radius that won't let you push it you know, too far. It'll basically just turn into something like a circle. Now, if we switch this from Bezier to poly, now we have this count option and that will allow us to add more points to our bevel. So if we add enough, it gets kind of smooth like that. And we end up with this kind of cartoony flower shape. So when we have this set to just one where it's flat like that, um, this is pretty good for making things like gears or cogs and things like that. So let's actually look at these two together, filled like that. And I'll add the fill curve just to the star right here to make it look more like a gear. And I'll turn this up a little higher like that. And if we want this to look even more like a gear, then we could extrude it with an extrude mesh node right here. And just mess with the scale like that. And we have a quick gear generator and it's completely non-destructive. We can change the amount of teeth that it has like that and how long, you know, the teeth are and things like that. So, so this is just one example of how you would use all of these nodes together. Next, let's talk about resampling. And to do that, I want to start with a different primitive shape. So I'm just going to delete all of these right here. And the one that I'm going to use is the curve line. So you can just plug that one in. And this is a pretty simple shape. It's just two points, the start and the end point right here. Now let's hit Shift A under Curves. Let's choose the Resample Curve node right here. When we plug this in, you won't notice anything immediately happening. But basically what it's doing is it's turning these two points into 10 points right here. And it's easier to tell what's going on if you're like deforming this or instancing onto the points. So let's displace this with a Set Position node. We can go to Geometry, Set Position right here. And this is similar to how you would use the displacement modifier like that. So let's bring in a noise texture. And you can just follow along. We're going to plug the color into the offset right here. And you can see it's starting to deform like that. But I want to keep this in the middle. And the way we would do that is with a vector math node set to subtract. And you can just turn this up until it's in the middle. But the number that works best is going to be 0.5. Now, if you want to change the strength of this, like how far it's pushing away from its, you know, normal position, you can just duplicate this right here and either set this to multiply or scale. I usually choose scale. And now when you turn this down to zero, it'll be a straight line. And when you start turning it up, it'll, you know, start to deform like that. This is a good way to visualize what this resample curve node does, because right now the noise texture is trying to deform this line, but it only has 10 points to work with. So when we turn it up higher, you can see that it'll slowly get higher and higher resolution 
until we have a pretty smooth curve like that. And if you want different results, obviously you can just change the noise texture. So I'll turn the detail down and I'll turn the scale down also. So the resample curve node set to count is just going to let you set the amount of points that this contains. We also have this other option length, which is going to let you set how close each point is to, you know, the next one. This kind of works the opposite way where higher resolution is a smaller number. So if we set this to 0 0.01, now this is more detailed. And this is nice to use because it's not really dependent on how long the curve is. Like if we, you know, make the curve a lot longer, all of these points will always be the same distance from each other. And so the resolution will always look the same. But if we have this set to count, if we keep turning this up at a certain point, you'll start to see the resolution change because we're making this bigger, but it still has 250 points in it like that. So the longer you make this, the lower resolution it'll look basically. So this is one way to make curves look smooth, but there is another way and that's with uh, handle types. So let's just turn this down to something a lot lower, like 10. So it's kind of jagged like that. Now let's go to shift A, curve, and we have set spline type right here. So we need to use this. Right now, I believe this is set to poly by default, but we're gonna change this to Bezier. Now shift A again, under curve, we're going to choose set handle type. And by default, this is set to auto. So let's just drop this in. And you can see immediately, this is going to smooth it out. So it's hard to visualize what it means uh, by handle type. So I encourage you to actually just bring in like a spline shape that you can go into edit mode with. When you have one of these points selected, you can see there are two handles like that. And if you right click, you see we have set spline type and set handle type right here. So you can experiment with all of these different options and the different spline types right here. So let's set this to the same thing where we set this to automatic. So we also have the option to move handles around. So if you select one of the handles and hit G, you can move it around like that. And different handle types will act differently. So if you set the handle type to free instead, now you can move both of these handles individually like this, and it will kind of create a sharper you know, shape. And we can also do the same thing with geometry nodes. So let's go back over to our geometry nodes right here. You can see we have all of those same options right there. And we also have a curve to set the handle position. So shift A under curve, we have set handle positions right there. And this one is a little different because we can't set the position of the left and right handle at the same time. So if you want to set the position of both, you just need two different ones, one after another, and I'll set one to left and one to right like that. Now, if you wanna change the position of both of these handles at the same time, you can use a vector node. So shift A under input, we have a vector right here, and you can just plug this into both of these. And setting the handle positions is good for making something like hanging cables. So instead of this going up and down on the Z axis, let's change this to zero and set the X to one. So it's going across like that. Now we can set both of the handle positions to go down on the Z axis like that. And if we change this from auto to something else like free, you can see we're getting kind of this hanging cable effect like that. Once again, if we're not sure how this is reacting in geometry nodes, we can always just test it out on our curve over here. So right now this is set to free and we can you know make a sharp pinch like that. But if we set the handle types to automatic, then it will get smoothed out and we only have the option to move both of the handles at the same time like that. So that's why it looks different between uh, free and auto like that. Auto is always going to try to look smoother. So if you wanted more, you know, droops, you could just turn the count up like that, or you could turn it down for fewer. So if we wanted to give this some thickness, we can do that with a node called curve to mesh. So shift A under curve at the top, we have curve to mesh right here. And I'll just put this at the very end. You can see this has another input called profile curve. So we need a second curve to define what this is going to be shaped like. So let's bring in another curve primitive, the curve circle right here. So let's plug this in to the profile curve right there. And by default, the radius of this circle is one meter. So this is way too big. Let's just set this to something like 0 0.01. Now we have a curve with some thickness and the shape of this is just the curve circle right here. So that's what this shape on the end is right there. And if we turn the resolution down to something like four, 
it becomes a little more apparent because this just turns into like a square. Now by default when you do this it's going to keep the shading smooth so if you don't want it to be smooth you can use a set shade smooth node right here and you can just drop it in afterward and uncheck shade smooth and you can see now we have hard edges like that. We also have this fill caps option right here and when we check that the end closes off for us right there. So I'm just going to delete all of these nodes right here. So we just have the curve line and the resample curve. And I'm just going to turn the count up to something high like 250. So if we didn't want our curve to be the same thickness all the way through, we can uh, change that. But the thing is, the radius for our circle has this round socket. So we can't plug textures and stuff directly into here unless it's a diamond socket. That's something I explained a little more in my other video, and I'll also put a link to the documentation on that on different socket types in the description. So to change the radius with a texture or something like that, we'll just hit Shift A, go to Curve, and set Curve Radius right here. We can just put it right before. And as you can see, the radius right here has a diamond socket, so we should be able to plug textures and stuff in. Just to show you what I mean, I'll just bring over this noise texture, I'll duplicate it with Shift D, and we'll plug it in right there. And as I turn the scale up, you'll be able to see that it's kind of making this a little lumpier, like that. But we can also use this other node called the Spline Parameter node. So let's hit Shift A, Curves, and we have Spline Parameter right here. So I'm just going to plug the factor into the radius right there. And I'm also going to turn the scale down so that this is just, you know, a straight line. I'll also make this a little thicker and turn this up a little higher right there. So basically what the factor is doing is looking at our curve and finding the start point and the end point. It's giving the start point a value of 0 and the end point a value of 1. And then every point in between is going to be interpolated. So it's sharp right here because it's giving the start point a value of 0. So it's like turning the radius down all the way. And the end point is going to have a value of 1. And our radius is 1 right now. So if we plug this in, the end should stay the same size like that because it's just going to you know, set it to 1. The length is a little different because instead of looking at the start and the end point, it's just going to check how long the, the curve is. So we can plug this in instead. This is only one meter long. As you can see over here, we have it set to one meter. So it's going to look the same, but as we make this higher, you can see the radius will just get bigger and bigger like that. So let's set this to like three for now. So this is the equivalent of setting the beginning to zero, which is just going to make it completely sharp and setting the end to 3 like that. So if we plug the length in right here, the end radius should stay the same size like that. But when we use the factor, the end is always going to be 1, so it's just going to kind of stretch out like that. The spline parameter node is really useful, and we're going to use it a lot more in this tutorial. So I'm going to change our line to go up on the z-axis again. So I'll set the x to 0 and the z to 1. And because of the way this works, if you wanted to use this for something like a spike or a piece of hair, this is kind of going the wrong way. So the factor is also a diamond, so we can also alter this. Um, one way you could reverse this is by just using a node called Reverse Curve. So Shift A under Curve, we have the Reverse Curve node right here. So you can just drop this in and it will basically switch the end point in the beginning. It's just changing the direction of the curve. We can also use a color ramp. Can drop that in right here and now we can just move these handles to you know change where we want things to happen you could also flip this all the way around like that and we can add in new colors and you know make interesting shapes things like that the one that i like to use the most is called float curve and we can just add points in by clicking like that and we can move them around by clicking and dragging if you hold control when you're clicking and dragging it'll snap to the grid in even spots like that. So this is a way you could, you know, make this more round or maybe more pointy like this. And you can add like complex shapes by adding multiple points in here like that. So you could make some vases or things like that. But one thing I do a lot is by setting both of these sides to zero and then dragging one up in the middle and setting that to one so that it's pointy on both sides and thickest in the middle like that. You can also change the handle types of these points. So if you wanted this to be pointy instead of round, you can just select this point and select this one right here. And now it's pointy like that. 
So let's talk about curve tilt now. So I'm actually just going to get rid of this float curve right here, and I'm gonna unplug the spline parameter and just turn the thickness down and maybe set this to something like four. Let's bring in the curve tilt node. So shift A under curve, we want set curve tilt right here, and we can just drop that in. And when we turn this, you can see that this will start rotating like that. But once again, notice that this has a diamond socket. So that means that if we want, we can plug textures and things like that into here. We can also plug in the factor from the spline parameter, and that will start to twist it like that. Now, if we wanted this to twist even more, we can bring in a math node like that and set this to multiply. Now, when we turn this up higher, it's going to twist more and more like that. So you could use this for cool things like wrought iron fences. And if when you're doing this, it doesn't look very smooth and it's looking glitchy, make sure that you have a resample curve node because when you have this set to something low, it might look kind of broken. You want to make sure you have enough resolution. And you can use the curve tilt node with a bunch of different uh, curve types. So instead of using the curve line, I'm just going to delete these two and I'll bring in a curve circle right here. And I'm going to turn the radius up quite a bit. So this is how you could make a torus with geometry nodes. Now, if we turn the multiply up, that's controlling the curve tilt. You can see that it's twisting, but it kind of has a start and end point right here. And it's going to look pretty broken unless this is going around 360 degrees. So right about there, it's going to look not broken. But you can see this doesn't say 360. Um, like I explained in my last video, uh, that's because this is using something called radians. 360 degrees in radians is the same thing as pi times 2, so you can just type that in and that will line up perfectly, or you can type in tau, T-A-U, and that's the same number. If you don't want to do that, you can just use another math node right here, and we have something called two radians like that. So this is going to let you put degrees in and it's going to output radians. So you can just plug one of those in and type in 360, or you know, if you want, you can multiply this by 2 and it will start twisting around twice. And if this isn't high enough resolution, you can just turn the resolution of the circle up to make it smoother, like that. And you can get some really cool shapes. Now, if we wanted to, we could make this spin around and go uh, inside of itself. We can do that with another math node. We'll just put right after the multiply and set this to add. So when you set this to add, it will spin inside. Let's actually turn this to zero for now. So you can see when we turn this up, it's going to do this kind of motion. So now if we set this to 360 and do it, it's doing the same thing, but it's also twisted. And if we want, we can animate this with the scene time node right here. And we can plug the seconds into the value right there. And now when we press the spacebar to make it play, it will animate like that. We can take this a step further by extruding this. So let's add in an extrude mesh node right here and turn this down a little and we can scale all of these faces in with a scale elements node right here and for the selection you just want to choose the top like that now we can scale that in a little and you can just mess with the resolution of the profile curve right here and the resolution over here also and you can get some really cool results let's take a break to talk about the sponsor sketchfab Sketchfab is an online marketplace where you can buy and sell 3D models. They have more than 3 million models to choose from, and deciding which models you want to download is actually pretty fun, because you can inspect them in the browser to see them from any angle and check out the materials and geometry. Sketchfab also has importer add-ons that make it really easy to get models into your projects. So if you're looking for assets to fill your scenes, check out Sketchfab. Alright, let's talk about the trim curve node. So to talk about the trim curve node, I'm going to delete the extrude mesh and scale elements like that. And I'm also going to get rid of the curve tilt stuff over here. I'll also turn the radius down a little so it's thinner. And now we can hit shift A under curve, find the trim curve node right here. And when we drop this in right here and start moving stuff, you'll notice it won't really work. That's because the shape we're using right now is cyclic, which means that the end and the start are going to connect to each other. So we can make it not do that with another node under curve. We have a set spline cyclic right here. We can drop that in. And as soon as we do that, you'll see that it kind of splits right there. That's the end point. 
And we can turn that on and off with this switch right there. So now that it's not cyclic, we can see what it does. It's basically making it grow along the curve like that. And that's moving from the end. We can also move from the beginning like that. Or if we want, we can select both of them at the same time by clicking and dragging downward like that. And now we can move it like that. So it's just kind of like a segment going along our curve. So if you want, you can make other curve shapes cyclic also. This is just the line that we were distorting earlier. And you can see if I click cyclic, it's just going to connect the beginning and end points like that. So right now the trim curve notice sets a factor, which means that the start and the end will always be between zero and one like that regardless of the size of our curve. But we also have this length option right here, which is going to be displayed in meters like that. Um, and this acts a little different because it's going to check the length of your curve right here. So if we make our curve bigger, we can just come over to our circle and turn the radius up. You can see that the arc is going to be a different length now like that. But if we have this set to factor over here, um, now it will always kind of be the same shape. So that's just something to keep in mind. So you might have noticed that the trim curve node has these diamond sockets, which again means that you can control it with like a texture or a random value. So we can bring over a noise texture from over here and plug that in. Um, but because we only have one curve, it's not really going to look very interesting. So to make it more clear what's happening, we're gonna make a whole bunch of curves. So I'm just gonna detach this set position node right here and we're gonna delete this circle. And we're going to get rid of the set spline cyclic also. I'll create a grid and I'm going to scatter a bunch of points on here with the distribute points on faces like that. We can preview this with alt shift and left click. This is something I went into greater detail in my last video about instances. So you can check that out if you want more explanation. But basically this lets us scatter as many points as we want. And then we can instance onto these points with an instance on points node. And on here, I just want a whole bunch of lines. So I'll search for curve line right here, and we can plug that in. So let's plug this into our trim curve and plug everything back in. Now these look a little too thick, so I'll just turn this down quite a bit. And I'm also gonna turn the resolution of our profile curve down to four. Now I'll plug the factor back into the end right here, and you can see they're all going to be the same height now. Um, this is because we need to realize the instances. Again, this is a thing that I talked about in the instance video. So we can grab a realize instances node, plug that in, and now they'll all be different lengths. Let's just turn the density up so we have way more of these curves like that. Change the radius a little too. And now the length of these is going to depend on this noise texture right here. So if we turn the scale down, you'll notice that uh, it'll get a little smoother and it'll actually start looking like a noise texture like that. But just remember that if you do this, it's not gonna work right unless you realize the instances like that. Now, if you wanted to do something like this for hair or you know, like a bunch of trees or things like that, you might want to distort all of these too. So let's just turn this down quite a bit and I'll get rid of the trim curve and the noise texture right here. And I'm gonna bring back our set position and our noise texture from over here which as we saw before, is just going to make these all more squiggly. And plug this in and turn the scale up. I need to resample this because it's only two points right now. So we can put a resample curve right here and turn this up a little higher. I'll set it to 100. And I wanna be able to see the plane that we're using, the grid right here. So I'll add a join geometry at the end right here and make sure that the curve is plugged in. If you want a lazy connect like this, that's a node wrangler thing. You can hold alt and right click and drag like that. And that will let you connect things across like long distances. And you can add reroute nodes like this with a shift, right click and drag to make things you know easier to see. So now we can see the plane that they're all being instanced from. And you might notice that all of the start points are kind of drifting around also when we move this. Um, which, you know, if you're trying to make like hair or trees or something like that, you don't really want them to be lifting off of the ground or, you know, hairs that are floating above the head. So if you want this to stick to the surface, that's when we can use the spline parameter node again. So we'll bring the spline parameter back right here. 
And remember that it's going to set the start point of each of these to zero. So when we multiply things by zero, they always stay zero. So all we have to do is take this right here and add another node at the end and set it to multiply. And we can plug the factor in there. And now all of the start points will stay zero no matter what, even if you turn this up really high like that. Now let's talk about if you wanted things to be instanced on the curve. Like if you wanted all of these to be trees with branches, a way that you could make branches is by instancing lines onto these lines. Instead of looking at a whole bunch, let's just look at one single line. So I'm going to delete the grid and I'll get rid of the instance on points and realize instances. So we just have this one line in the middle right here. So let's select all of these. I'm just going to click and drag. That's a box select right there and move these back. And we're going to put an instance on points node right here, instance on points. And I want to be able to see our original curve right here. So I'm going to add in a join geometry node and we can just plug it in like that. I'll just move this down so we can see it a little better. Now I'll duplicate the curve from over here with shift D and we can use this as the instance like that. And I'm just going to make this uh, 0.1 meters on the X and I'll set the Z to zero like that. So now we have like a whole bunch of lines that are uh, sticking out from the side and there should be a hundred different branches because of this resample curve right here. If we set this to 10, then we only have 10 branches like that. But you'll notice that, you know, it's a lower resolution curve too, that, you know, it's being distorted right here, but it's a lot more jagged now because it's lower resolution. So there is another node that you can use to create all of these points and choose how many branches you want. And it's called the curve to points node. So shift A, curve, and at the top we have curve to points right here. So let's turn this resample curve back up to 100 and drop the curve to points in right here before the instance on points. So this is going to look really similar to the resample curve node. It's going to have count like that. We also have length and evaluated. Evaluated is kind of like setting it to automatic. It's going to not give you any options. So I don't really use it that much. But this is nice because you get the original curve being uh, you know, as smooth as you want over here. But you can also add as many points as you want here. And you'll notice too that it takes a curve. There's a curve input and it outputs points. So if we preview this with Alt, Shift, and left click, go into wireframe node, you'll see that it turns these into points and the curve is no longer there. That's just a thing to keep in mind. Instead of using curve to points, you could also just use another resample curve right here, like that. And that's going to do a similar thing. But if we preview this, it will still give us a curve. It's just a lower resolution version of the curve. What's nice about this curve to points node is that it has all of these outputs for like the tangent and the normal and the rotation. I explained what the normals were in my instance video, so I'm not going to talk too much about it. But basically, if we plug the rotation into the rotation of our instance on points, you can see now that these will all stick out uh, in a different direction that's based on the shape of this curve. And when we move this around, you'll see that they, they kind of rotate accordingly. And these are sticking out in the normal direction right now. Like I showed in my last video, if you want to use the tangent direction instead, you need to bring in a node called align Euler to vector right here. And we can just take the tangent, and plug that into the vector, and then plug the rotation into the rotation. So the normal is going to stick out away from the object, and the tangent is going to kind of follow parallel to the object. So if we turn this down all the way, it's going to be hard to tell what's going on because they're following the same direction. But when you turn it up higher, it's easier to tell what's going on around these bends right here. Now, if you wanted, you could change the scale of all of these instances based on where they are on the curve using the spline parameter right here. And you can just plug the factor into the scale right here. Now, this isn't going to work if we're using the curve to points. This is something I explained in my last video. This is looking for a spline or a curve, but there is no curve plugged into here anymore because this outputs points instead. So this will work fine if we just remove this because now it does have a curve going into it. And you can see now that at the end right here, these, are all, these all have a scale of one. And at the beginning, they all have a scale of zero. And in between, it just kind of you know, transitions from one value to the other. 
So this is pretty useful for if you wanted branches to be different lengths at different heights. And if you wanted to customize this a little more, just like before, we can use a float curve or something like that. And you can, you know, make some more interesting shapes like that. So if you wanted to use the curve to points, but you still wanted the spline parameter to work, just like I showed in the last video, you'd have to use a capture attribute node. So we can bring in one of those capture attribute and just put it over here where uh, it's still a curve because over here it's points now. And then you would take the spline parameter. You can just plug the factor in over here and take the attribute from the capture attribute node and plug that into the scale instead. And it'll work the same way, except now you can use the curve to points if you want. Now the instance on points node also has the selection right here. So if you want this to look a little more random, you can plug a random value into here. I'll just type in random value and you want to make sure that is set to Boolean right there. And you can change the probability of, you know, one of the instances appearing. So it can look a little more random if you want. Another thing that we can do is rotate all of these around. Um, you know, like if this was a tree, you would want the branches to be sticking in multiple directions. So one way to do that is with a rotate instances node right here. And we just want to target the, the local Z right here. And this only has one plug, so we want three. So we need to use a combine XYZ right there. And we can uh, plug whatever we want into this Z right here. So we can use another random value if we want and set this to float, plug it in right here and just turn the maximum up a little higher. And now these will rotate, you know, in random directions, basically. One thing that I like to do is use an index node. This is basically going to count how many points there are and give you that number. So we can plug that in here too. And the benefit of using the index node is that this will give you more like regular geometric shapes and patterns. So if we bring in a math node set to multiply and turn this down to zero, when we start to slowly turn it up, you'll see some like spiral patterns like this. Now this would be pretty cool for making something like a spiral staircase or like you could use this for DNA or maybe like a pipe cleaner if you turn it up high enough like that. So definitely experiment with the index node. So I'm just going to delete these uh, rotate instances for now. Get rid of the curve to points right here and I'm going to unplug the scale also so they're all the same size. And now we're left with as many instances as we have from the resampled curve node over here. And I'm going to hit shift A and bring in a endpoint selection node right here. We can just plug that in and you can see what it's doing is it's placing an instance on the beginning and on the end right here, which is specified by this. So if we want, we can set the start size to zero and now it's only going to instance onto the endpoint. but we can also turn this up and it will just select as many as we're specifying. So this is 10 starting from the very end. I'm just going to set the end size to one for now. And there's some pretty cool stuff you can do with this. So I'll set up an example. And to do this, I'm going to instance a whole bunch of lines onto a plane like I did earlier. So I'm going to remove all of these and I'll remove all of the distortion stuff too. I'll add the grid back, distribute points on faces, instance on points, and I'll use the curve right here as the instance. And I want to realize the instances and now we can plug that into our set position right here. And now this is what we have. It's just a whole bunch of lines sticking out of a plane like we had before. So now we can use this set position to move all of these instances around like that, but we can use the endpoint selection. We plug it into here to move only the endpoint if we want like that. And we can even control the position of all of the endpoints with a separate object. So I'll bring in like an icosphere and I'll just scale that down like this, select the curves again over here. And I'm just gonna drag the icosphere over from the outliner like this, click and drag. And then I'll plug the location into the position of the set position right here. And you wanna make sure that this is set to relative so that when we move this around, you can see it's changing all of the endpoint positions to wherever this object is right here. All right, so now let's work on that point connector like I showed in the beginning. I'm just going to start off with a fresh node tree right here, and we're not going to use the group input for this, so I'll just detach that, and we're going to add in whatever shape we want. I'll add in an icosphere right here and just plug that in. 
and I want to distribute a whole bunch of points onto here. So I'll use a distribute points on faces like that, and I'll turn the subdivision up a few times just so it's a, you know, a little smoother like that. And now I want a curve to connect all of these points together. So the way we're going to do this is with a is with a curve line and I'll use a set position. I'll plug the curve into the geometry and the geometry in right here. So now all of these are detached over here. And basically what I want to do is get the position of all of these points and feed that into this set position node right here. So the way we're going to get all of the positions is with a transfer attribute node. So you can shift A and it's under transfer attribute right here. This is similar to the capture attribute. But if we look at these two, one main difference is that this only outputs an attribute. This one outputs geometry and an attribute. We're not really going to connect the geometry from this to anything. So that's why we're going to use the transfer attribute right here. If we were going to try to use the capture attribute, it wouldn't work correctly because it wants this geometry to go somewhere. So we'll take the points from right here and feed it into the source. And we want to get the position. So I'll bring in a position node right here and I'll plug that into the attribute. But as you can see, these are two different colors. Um, we need to change this to a vector so that it's the same color. And instead of getting the nearest face, I want to get the index. So this is basically going to look at every single point over here in order and find the position of it. Now we can plug the attribute in over here and our curve is over here now. This only has two points, so we need to resample it to give it more geometry. So I'll bring in a resample curve like that. And you can see as we turn this up, at some point it's going to connect all of these points. Now if we add more points over here, now it's not connecting all of them anymore. So I also want a way to count all of these points. And if we look over at our spreadsheet over here, you can see that there are 153 control points. And if we look at our points over here, there are supposed to be 597. So we have the information available to us. And there is a way to capture it over here. Um, that's using a different node called the attribute statistic. So we can plug the points into there right here. And you can see it outputs all of these options for us. What we're looking for is the maximum but we need to plug an attribute into here first. We're going to look for the index. The index is basically just going to count all of the points. We'll plug it in right here, and now we want to use the maximum, and we can just plug it into our resample curve. And this will always give us the right amount of points for however dense this is right here. You can see it even changing over here, the amount of control points like that. It's just going to match the number of points over here. Let's give this some thickness now with a curve to mesh. And we can plug a circle into the profile curve. So I'll search for circle, curve circle right here. And I'll turn this down to 0 0.01. And I'll also turn the resolution down to something a little lower, like six. Now I'll bring in a set radius, set curve radius right here, and a spline parameter. And I'll plug the factor in right here. So now the start should be thin and the end point should be thick. Now I want this to like trace the line instead of just being fully completed. So for that, we can use a trim curve and I'll just put this before all of the, the set curve radius and stuff can put, put it right here. And now we can trace it like that. But what I want to do is basically select both of these and have it kind of run through like this automatically. So for that, I'll bring in a value node right here and we can use that for the start. And I'll bring in a math node set to add. Now we can plug the value into the add and the add into the end right here. So this is going to let us specify how far apart the start and the end are over here. So we can set this to something like 0.1 or something like that. And now when we move the value, they'll always be the same distance apart like that. But you'll notice when this goes above one, it just disappears. I want this to just start over when it goes past one. So we can actually do this pretty easily. What I'll do is I'll just duplicate this, uh, this math node right here, and I'll set this to modulo. Now, whatever number we put here is going to be the maximum number that it hits before it goes back to zero. So we can just set this to one right here. And now whenever the value goes above one, it's just going to get reset back to zero. So you'll see 
it goes above one right here, and then it restarts. And if you hover over any of these sockets, it'll actually give you the value, if it's a value that it can give you. Right now I have this set to 1.16, but after it goes through the modulo, it's just 0.16. So this should make it so it always stays underneath one now. And if we want this to animate on its own, we can just replace the value with a scene time node right here. I'll just plug the seconds in like that. And if it's going too fast, you can just divide it by whatever you want. Basically, the higher you turn this value up, the slower it'll go, like that. And it'll just start tracing it. Now, this is looking pretty jagged, and we can smooth this out by changing like the spline type and the handle type and all that, or we can use a fillet curve node. So I'll bring in the fillet curve. And we can just drop it in right there. And we're going to want to limit the radius so we don't get the, all of these parts flying off the side like that. I'll just sample this right here with Alt, Shift, and left click. And it's basically going to take all those sharp parts right there and bevel them like that as much as it can. And if we want this to be even rounder, we'll just set it to poly right here and turn the count up like that. And you can see all of those corners get rounder. Now this should look a little smoother like this. And this will trace whatever shape you want. So if we want, we can change this icosphere to something else. Or if we want, also, we could bring in some other shape from the outside. So I'll bring in Suzanne the monkey right here. And I'll just drag that into our node tree. And I'll get rid of the icosphere and plug in the geometry from Suzanne. And if we take a look at what's happening now, it's going to scatter a bunch of points on Suzanne, and then it's going to take a line and try to connect all of those points like that. And we can get different results by turning the density up right here. Uh, and you can also change this to, instead of random, to Poisson disk and turn this up a little higher so that they're, you know, spaced apart a little differently. If you change the distance minimum, you're going to get a lot more kind of round and um, like more random tangled looking shapes. But if you have this set to random, um, it's going to look a lot more regular. So let's uh, hide Suzanne. This is what it looks like right now. And let's just change the speed to go even faster. There you have it. All right, that's it for this one. Let me know in the comments what other Geometry Nodes stuff you want me to cover. And if you want more videos now, I do have a playlist with all of my Geometry Nodes videos that you can check out. I'd like to thank my patrons for their support, and I'd like to thank you for watching. Have a good one.